Please be seated. It is good to see all of you here this day. And as we come to the Word of God for this morning, I invite you please to turn with me in your copy of the Scriptures to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, as we come to start a new chapter in this book and take up the crucial topic of Christian unity. Philippians chapter 2, here as the Apostle Paul urges, the congregation in Philippi and all other congregations after them to walk in gospel harmony, he writes the following and says, Philippians 2, picking up at verse 1, Paul, by the direction and aid of the Holy Spirit, writes the following and says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Verse 4, let each of you Look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Brethren, let's pray. Our great and glorious God, how thankful we are that we can come this day and worship you in the beauty of holiness. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are the God who has redeemed us. You are the God who has saved us. We're thankful, Lord, that as with Abraham of old, we have been justified in your sight. Not by our works, no, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Abraham literally said amen to God with reference to his Messiah to come. And we say amen to that same Messiah who has come. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your doing and your dying and your rising on our behalf. We're thankful that you are our justification, that you are our righteousness before the Lord our God. And Father, we come this day fully conscious of his merits and his grace, which alone commends us to you. We're thankful, O God, that for many in this place we are accepted in the beloved Jesus, not in ourselves, but in your Son. And we are so grateful, Lord, that because you've loved him, you love us just the same. And Father, we come this morning, therefore, joyful, thankful. We come with hearts full of praise and gratitude for the great work which you have wrought in our lives. Oh God, we're thankful that although we were not seeking you, you were seeking us, and that you found us in the fullness of time. Father, we pray, therefore, that you would come to us this day, your needy people, and continue to instruct us in the way of truth and righteousness. We ask, O God, that this day you would empower both speaker and hearer alike to embrace your word and to be found following it all of our days. O God, you have a word from heaven for us this morning. And so come and speak for your servants listen. Give us grace, O God, to not only hear with the outer ear, but with the inner heart. And might our feet be found following after you in all that you've given to us in your word. Come then, we pray, O God, again, drive away all distractions. Might you be central in all that is said and done. O Lord, bless us, your needy people, and for all of these things. We will praise and bless your most wonderful name. We ask them through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Disunity. What a terrible thing it is. Disunity, which is defined by one online dictionary as disagreements and divisions is that, dear friends, which is completely against the Word of God, is carnal and is a great hindrance to any local congregation. Now, 
If you have been in the church long enough, then you know that from time to time there will be disunity. You know that from time to time there will be divisions among the people of God concerning this thing or that thing. And really, brethren, it's a great shame and great sin when this happens. It's great shame and great sin because it violates our Lord's words in John 17 when he prayed to his Father asking him that we would be one. And it's a great shame and great sin because it violates such a clear passage as found in Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul calls us to, quote, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and this in the bond of peace. Now, in contrast to this horrible thing, which is called disunity, unity is a beautiful thing. Unity, or gospel agreement among ourselves, is a fantastic thing. For as the psalmist says in Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold, or look and see how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, unfortunately, as we've seen a bit in recent days, there was some disunity, some disagreements among some of the brethren there at the church in Philippi. There were some divisions which were occurring among some in this congregation, which overall was a healthy church. And so what then did the Apostle Paul do about this matter? I mean, did he just gloss over this whole issue and say nothing with reference to it? Well, church, not at all. Rather, as we've seen in recent days, Paul has addressed this issue in this book. He spoke against it and even mentioned some individuals by name who were causing divisions in the church as set forth in chapter 4 of this book. And so why then did Paul do this? I mean, why did he even bother to bring up this topic? Well, brethren, he did so because he knew that a divided church was a defeated church. He, he did it because he knew that if the believers in Philippi were not operating in Christian harmony, then soon the house of God would be greatly harmed. Well, again, in view of this, Paul, by the direction and aid of the Holy Spirit, spoke to them about this. In view of how important it is that you and I, as the people of God, walk as one all of our days, he addressed this topic at several points in this glorious epistle. Well, for this morning, for our time together, we come to the first major section in this book where the Apostle Paul deals with Christian unity at length. Up until this point in this letter, he has only spoken about this matter here and there, but now he does this overtly. Now I'm glad that he did this, and I say this because his words before us today are absolutely crucial, absolutely vital for each and every one of us in this place to understand and to get as Christians. You see, brethren, if you and I are going to continue to know God's richest benedictions upon us and so honor the Lord Jesus Christ in all things, then we must make sure that we are obeying the Apostle Paul with reference to this crucial matter of Christian unity. Now, I just pause for a moment to ask you all here this day, is there anyone among us who does not want unity? I ask, is there anyone in this place who wants to disrupt the glorious peace that we have among ourselves? Well, of course there isn't, I know. Therefore, dear ones here this morning, may it be that our great God will give each of us the help and grace that we need in order to understand and to apply our passage to our lives. And so as we come then to our verses in view for today, come with me first to notice in verse 1 of this chapter, Paul's rationale for Christian unity. You see the first heading there in your bulletins. Here, as the apostle puts forth 
this major emphasis in this new section of this book, he writes saying first, note the language, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and if any affection and mercy. Now, it is quite interesting to note here that instead of Paul beginning this new part of this letter by rebuking the Philippians for their disunity, that as a means of helping them, and no doubt us as well, to be unified, he appeals to them based on what he knows was true of them because of the common salvation that they experienced by grace. Here, Paul speaks about what they had come to know in their own lives by way of regeneration, by way of the new birth. And because of this, he says to them, don't be divided. Rather, be united as the people of God. Now, I sincerely wish that our English Bibles at this point here captured the essence of this truth better, which I just put forth before you in verse 1 of this chapter. But unfortunately, they don't, at least uh, not as much as I wish they did. And so because of this, uh, let me just take a moment to speak about our sentence in view for this morning. Here is Paul begins it. Look at again verse 1. He begins it with this little word, therefore. And this little word, therefore, logically connects us to what he said back in verse 27 of the previous chapter, as most commentators know. Look at the words with me there in your Bibles. Paul writes saying, only this one thing you recall, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. To what end? Here it is. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you, quote, stand fast in one spirit, not two, with one mind, not two, doing what? Here it is, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so, having just mentioned this matter of them having oneness among them, Paul now, in our verse in chapter 2, puts forth four if statements in order to flesh out this topic of unity some more. Here he says, look again at the words, Philippians 2 and verse 1, he writes saying, Therefore, again connecting it to his early thought, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and if any affection and mercy, he says then, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, etc. Now, to me at least, the problem with this translation is that it makes it seem that these four if statements here by the apostle uh, might be true or might not be true. That's how it comes across, at least to me, in our English Bibles. I've always found verse 1 in this chapter difficult to understand. Now you should note that in the Greek text, uh, the word if here in our verse is not a word of uncertainty, no. Rather, it's a word of definitive certainty. Uh, this is the case. Uh, thus, I agree with uh, John MacArthur when he says that the word if here may better be translated and rendered as because, as because. And this is because this gives a more complete idea of the meaning of the words at hand. Now, if we translate the sentence like this, then it would read as follows. Note it with me in your Bibles. Therefore, because there is consolation or encouragement in or with reference to our union with Christ, and because there is the comfort of his love, which we regularly experience by his grace, and because there is fellowship or partnership of the Holy Spirit among us, since he's in all of us, and because there is affection and mercy, which in this context seems to suggest that that affection and mercy is that which comes to us from God the Father. Paul says, therefore, we are to obey him in these words so that out of these spiritual realities which we experience from God, we are to express them to others in the church, which no doubt will promote great gospel harmony among us. And so I ask, dear brothers and sisters here this day, do you see how understanding the verse like this helps us to get a better sense for what the Apostle Paul is saying? Understanding it in this way helps us to clearly see that Paul here is making his appeal for unity among the Philippians and all the other Christians after them 
based upon the good spiritual things that we have received from God as his people. Now, having said all of these things, it's also crucial that you and I understand, listen, that if a person claims to be a true Christian, but they are really not a true Christian, then they will not know any of these divine blessings which were just mentioned coming to them from God, thus they will not be able to show these wonderful blessings to others. I mean, here again, listen, here the Apostle Paul is assuming that this is what's happening in the life of the one who truly possesses Christ, but if not, then such an individual is going to be a contentious person in the church who lacks much grace and causes much disunity. And so here then, in view of what I just said, I believe that you and I, all of us here this day who name the name of the Lord, I believe that we need to examine our own walk with Christ. I mean, here Paul is highlighting to us some wonderful Trinitarian blessings which true Christians receive from God, love and grace and mercy and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are to show such things to others. And if not, then we need to ask ourselves, are we really in the faith? Are we really Christians? Well, brethren, I say that we need to ask ourselves this morning, are we truly God's people? For if we cannot show to others what God has graciously given to us, then I say there is a real cause for alarm. Real cause for alarm. If you've been saved by God's grace, and if he daily meets with you, and daily comforts you, and daily helps you, etc., out of all those things, you should be such a person who is kind and generous, who is a big to promote unity among other Christians. But if not, maybe the problem is, is that you've never been born again. Maybe the problem is that the root of the matter is not in you. And so again, if that is you, then I believe there is a cause for alarm. Now, uh, flip this in a more positive direction. And as I do, note that Paul is saying something here positively very encouraging. Again, in our verse, he's assuming uh, that you and I are the true people of God. Thus, as a result of this, we will receive much from the Lord. He's assuming that because we are saved, that we are regularly receiving much encouragement, that we are regularly receiving a a comforting love, that we are regularly receiving fellowship and affection and mercy from the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is what he's assuming is true. Why? Because this is the very thing which is true. This is the case, brethren. Therefore, in view of this, I say, what a glorious thing it is to be a true Christian. What a wonderful thing it is. These are spiritual blessings which come to us because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that, again, what's contained in verse 1 is really a marvelous thing. One which we must think on uh, long and hard and be blessed as we do. And bless our God because all of these things are spiritual realities which are ours in Christ. Now, of course, no doubt. Uh, The sad reality is that at times in our lives we may not be experiencing all of these things which Paul speaks about in verse 1. We may not be experiencing encouragement in Christ or comfort and uh, love by him. Uh, We may not be feeling a partnership in the Holy Spirit as it were and affection and mercy. We may not be experiencing these things to the same level or to the same degree for, for various reasons. Oh, but church, because all of these things are ours, in fact, in Christ, I say that you and I, who are true Christians, are to seek God daily for them. Because all of these things are ours in Jesus, we are to regularly look to him for the spiritual blessings all of our days. And so, having seen, firstly, from verse 1, Paul's rationale for Christian unity. You all are saved. You all receive great spiritual blessings from God. Therefore, dispense those blessings to others and be unified. Come with me now, secondly, to note his command for this in verse 2 of this chapter. Having just said, what should be true of all of us because we have been converted? Paul now exhorts us based on this sturdy foundation and says that out of this, look at the language, We are to fulfill his joy. 
by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, I like that Paul here speaks about the Philippians fulfilling his joy in connection to them being unified. And I say this because without a doubt, it is a true, it is a great, it is a fantastic joy for any gospel minister when his people are living in Christian unity. And so you see, just as a side note here, what you do as a Christian in this church, what you do as a member in this church matters. Not only matters to God, but it matters to your pastors. In fact, church, as pastors, this is one of our greatest delights in this place, that you are all being unified, and so may it always be true for you. Here Paul says first, look at the language, fulfill my joy. Now, the word fulfill uh, simply means here to uh, make complete or to make full. And then in describing four ways in which this is to be done, he says firstly, look at the language, that this is to be done by us being like-minded, or quite literally from the Greek text, being of the same pattern of thinking. Second, he says, it's by us having the same love, or by us expressing that mutual agape love among ourselves, which is a disposition which always looks out for the good of the one love. Third, Paul says that it's by us being of one accord, or much better translated from the Greek text, being of one soul. I don't know why they have a cord. It should be soul, the Greek word suke, which means that of us having a real deep inner fellowship and union among ourselves as the people of God. Be of one soul. And then fourthly, he says that we are to be of one mind, which reinforces what he said back in the beginning of the verse, which of course doesn't mean that uh, we never are going to have differences of opinions on secondary matters, no, but rather that in the main things pertaining to the Christian life and the gospel, there will be great harmony among us. Listen then to Spurgeon in this regard as he comments on these words. He writes saying, quote, Paul would have all of God's people to be unanimous for that is the precise interpretation of the Greek text. He says that the apostle would, quote, have the Philippians and us to hold the same views, receive the same truth, and to contend for the same faith. Well, uh, Spurgeon is absolutely correct in what he said. And again, as I said, in my heading for this verse, don't miss it, church, this is a command here by the Apostle Paul. It's a command, not a suggestion, but it's a command, which you and I, with the help and grace of God, must seek to fulfill. A simply stated, Paul's words here in verse 2 are not some take it or leave it suggestion. Well, I don't really feel like being unified with my brethren. Or I really don't want to be like-minded and, and of one accord with them. No, this is not a suggestion. This is not a left up to us if we want to obey it or not. No, this is a command. Consequently, you and I, by the grace of God, must always seek to fulfill what Paul has called us to do. For if not, it will be great sin against God, and it will be great sin amongst your brethren. And so, as Paul goes on then, in the following verse, to spell out for us exactly how all of these things will be accomplished among us. He speaks about this matter in verses 3 and 4 of this chapter, and we'll consider it under the heading of the expressions of Christian unity, the expressions of this whole matter. Here is Paul helps us in this regard. He writes saying firstly negatively and then positively in verse 3 of this chapter, note the words again in your Bibles, he writes saying, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Now, in the Greek text here, in the beginning of the sentence, uh, the words here are very emphatic, very emphatic, very strong. So that by use of a double negative, the words could read as this. Paul says here, let absolutely nothing, not even one thing, that's a good translation, uh, the words being frontal in the sentence, let absolutely nothing, not even one thing, be according to selfish ambition or conceit. That's the emphasis of the original language. Now it seems here that by the Apostle Paul using this language here of selfish ambition or conceit that he's highlighting to us 
some specific sins which were connected to the Philippians themselves. Apparently from these words there was a selfish ambition and a conceit uh, happening among them. Uh, so that these individuals were, some of them at least, self-seeking. And they were uh, full of pride, at least that's the sense. Now of course both of these things, a self-seeking disposition and pride in the people, both of these things are complete recipes for destruction with reference to keeping unity and, and gospel harmony in the church. I mean, brethren, if you and I are acting selfishly and are full of pride, not being willing to listen to others in this place, etc., then we're going to create great disunity among ourselves. We're going to create a, a, a strife and, and friction and discord. And as I said in the outset of the message, what a great shame and what great sin this would be. Well, in contrast to us acting like this, Paul gives us a great remedy for all of this in 3b of this chapter. This is the case. So that in strong contrast to us, being full of selfish ambition and conceit, he writes saying, look at the words, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem or consider others better than himself. What's the remedy? Where is it to be found? It's to be found right here. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but uh, the Greek word Allah, it's, it's the strong contrast in the original language. Not this, but rather this, okay? How do we remedy it, Paul? Here it is. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now this whole matter here of us acting in lowliness of mind, or we might just say humility, is a major topic which is found all throughout the Word of God. In fact, time and again, we see that the Bible speaks against those who act pridefully, encouraging rather humility to be in us. Thus, this is why for example, if you're taking notes, Proverbs 11 and verse 2. We're told that when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. And this is why, again, we're told, for example, in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, that God does what? He doesn't rejoice over the proud, no. Rather, we're told that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I won't... Uh, speak at length with reference to this whole matter of humility at this point as God willing will come to it next week in the following verses and see the glorious display of it in our Lord Jesus Christ but suffice it to say you should note that humility is not thinking less of ourselves no rather it's thinking of ourselves less thinking of ourselves less humility is not hating on ourselves no but rather it's seeing how great and glorious God is and then seeing ourselves in that light, even as Sinclair Ferguson rightly says. Now concerning this a second matter of esteeming others better than ourselves, of course, uh, similar to what I was just saying, uh, this does not mean that you and I as uh, Christians are, for example, to think that everybody is uh, better than us in the world and that everybody is more gifted than we are or more superior than we are uh, because that might not be the case at all. Some people uh, think that's how they can be humble just by thinking that they're the worst person in the world, everyone's better, everyone's more superior, but that may not be the case at all. And so if not this, then what? Well, simply stated it means that when it comes to others, especially our brethren in the church, we are to treat them with preferential treatment. That's what it means. Esteem them. That's what it means. Preferential treatment. Red carpet. We're going to treat them really well. Oh, dear ones, it means that when it comes to others, especially in this place, we are to value them so highly that we seek to do them as much good as we possibly could do. That's what it means. Preferential treatment. You're my brother. You're my sister. How can I serve you? What can I do? Now, let me give my all for you. So that you might feel it and that you might know this is the case. Now, 
historically speaking, you should know that among the Philippians, this kind of action of esteeming others better than themselves would have been absolutely radical at that time. You see, in the Roman society in which the Philippians lived, the focus was always on individual honor and individual rank and individual glory even above others. Oh, but beloved brethren here this day, Paul says this is not Christian. He's coming against what was very common in that time. He says this is completely not how you and I are to act as the people of God. We're not to think ourselves better than others. No, we're to esteem others. We are to highly value others. For not even our Lord Jesus Christ acted in that negative worldly way, just as Paul will tell us in the following words. Well, finally then, as Paul speaks again, oncely, uh, firstly rather negatively, and then positively. He says to us lastly in verse 4 of this chapter, look at the words again with me in your Bibles. He writes saying, let each of you, none excluded, look out, or we might say scope out, that's the original, not only or merely his own interest or concerns, but also look out for the interest or concerns of others. Look out not only or merely for your own things, but also for the things of others. And so what's Paul's point here? Well, it is that if the Philippians and all believers after them are truly going to walk in Christian unity, then all of us must regularly have the personal interest and well-being of our brethren in view even above our own. That's what it means. Now again, this is very uh, much against nature because we're always looking out for uh, a number one, as it were, ourselves. Me, myself, and I. But Paul says, no, that's not Christian. That's not going to promote gospel harmony. No, 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 Paul says, don't do it. He says, you need to look out for the personal interest and well-being of your brethren even above yourself by the help and grace of God. And again, as I said, this is unfortunately not an easy thing to do for us. Now, of course, if this is going to happen among us, positively speaking, then we're going to need, need to know, rather, what the personal interest and needs of our brethren are, right? I mean, Paul uh, commands us to do this. Look out not only for your own interests, but the interest of others. Well, then I need to know what are the interests of others? What are the personal interests of others? What are the things they're struggling with? What are the difficulties they're having? I need to know what's going on in my brethren's life if I'm going to fulfill the word of God at this point. My brethren, you and I must regularly, by the grace of God, be getting our minds off ourselves. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, seek to find ways in which we can support and prosper others in this place. And this not only in temporal things, no, but also in spiritual things as well. And so here then is where we end the exposition of these opening words here in this new chapter in Philippians chapter 2 concerning the theme of Christian unity. Here in these words, what has Paul done? Well, he's given us his rationale for this matter. He's given us his command for this matter. And he's given us various expressions of the whole thing. And so, in view of all that we've considered for the past 35 minutes, what applications can I make for you here in this place who are true Christians? For you who know the Lord, what can I say? Well, there are many things that I can say, no doubt. But for today, there's just one main thing that I want to say, and it is this. Listen. Since, according to the Word of God, this whole matter of unity among ourselves is absolutely vital to everything that will ever take place in this church. I want all of you to think long and hard about how much harm would come to us if you don't obey our passage. That's my application. I could say several things, but I think this is sufficient. Since so much of what we do is tied to this whole matter of Christian unity, of gospel harmony, so much is tied to it, 
If we're going to go on as a church, if we're going to honor Jesus' name, uh, so many things, if we're going to advance in his truth uh, personally and corporately, since so many things are connected to us being one in God's Son, then brethren, I want all of you to think long and hard about how much harm would come to us if you, if I, do not obey our passage. Think about the great destruction. Think about the great ruin. Think about the heartache which will come if we, by the grace of God, don't obey our passage. Brethren, it will be tremendously terrible. It will be tremendously terrible. But we can just read the words and, and have them opened up and, and uh, speak about the context and, and the language here and there and put it all under nice headings. But if we walk away from this passage and don't think long and hard about its implications, brethren, we fail greatly. Christian unity is something which we must value greatly, but we must also seek to keep it as best as we can. It, it, it takes years to develop, but in a moment it could be lost. Why? Why is it lost? Well, look again in our passage. It gets lost because of pride. It gets lost because of self-seeking individuals. It, it gets lost because we esteem ourselves better than others. It gets lost for all kinds of reasons. And so let me ask you, is it going to be lost because of you? Because of you. You in this church. Myself included. Is it going to be lost because of me? Because of my pride? Because of my uh, putting myself above others? Because of uh, my not esteeming others better than myself? Is it going to be because of me? Is it going to be because of you? Who is it going to be because? Well, brethren, I help, hope rather that it's because of none of us. I hope it's because of none of us. I hope that it's because of none of us. I hope rather that when we don't fulfill the passage, when we are not acting in one accord and of one mind, when we do act selfishly and we're full of pride and we esteem ourselves better than others, that we'll be quick to repent, quick to ask for forgiveness, quick to go to our brother and sister and say, you know what? The way that came out really wasn't right, or you know what, the way I said it was just all uh, full of X, Y, and Z, you fill in the blank. Well, would you please forgive me? Why? Because I want to maintain gospel unity. I want to maintain the bond of peace in this place. I don't want to be the one who causes division among us. No, division's not from God. Division's from the devil. No, division's from remaining sin within, and I don't want that to be the the impetus for dividing the church. And so what do I need to do? I need to keep a close guard on my tongue, a close guard on my mind, my thoughts, my actions. Need to again be quick to repent, quick to apologize, quick to seek out our brethren for forgiveness, quick to grant forgiveness. Someone comes to you and says, look, at it, please forgive me for this thing or that thing. What do you say? Um, I'll think about that. You'll think about that? Really? Thank God that God doesn't say, I'll think about that. No, God forgives us. How many times? Oh, man, he keeps going and going. I'll forgive you. Why? Because I've been forgiven. Why? Because I know the realities of verse 1 of my passage, which speaks about things with reference to experiential Christianity. If God forgives me, can you imagine me not forgiving someone else? It's antithetical to Paul's rationale. If you've been forgiven, you forgive. And my friend, if you can't forgive others in this place, maybe it's because you've never been forgiven yourself. True Christians have been forgiven. True Christians have been loved. True Christians experience daily comfort from God. Therefore, I can dispense those things to you because they've been given to me by grace. And so how about you here this day, dear brother, dear sister, by way of application, Think about this whole matter of disunity and how ugly and how abhorrent it is in the house of God. Think about the ramifications which can come to us because of your sin, because of my sin, and fight against it with all that you've got. With all that you've got. 
Mortify pride by the power of the Holy Spirit. Say no to your lust, no to your anger, no to your pride. All of those things again. Say, oh God, no, 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 no. That wasn't right. I'm not doing that. And if I did it, I'm asking you for forgiveness and I'm asking that brother for forgiveness because I know the devil just loves to use a little thing like that to divide us. Thus we must be quick to repent, quick to own our sins, quick to go to our brother, to our sister, asking them to forgive us of any wrong done against them. And so, brethren, may it be that you and I, by the help and grace of God, obey our passage in view. May it be that you and I, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will determine to let nothing divide us in this place. We are brethren. We are part of the same family. And I know even within the best of families, there's trouble sometimes. We're going to step on each other's shoes. We're going to get under each other's skin. I get it. It happens. It's par for the course. But when it does, let's express what we have experienced from God to others. Loving our brethren, being long-suffering with reference to them, praying for them, Showing gospel grace time and again. This, dear friends, this, beloved brethren, is how we live out the implications of our text in view for today. And so what about for you here this day who are not true Christians? You here who are not truly saved. What can I say to you? Well, what I can say is simple, and it is this. Since your life has been filled with many of the sins which are spoken of in our text, such as selfish ambition and conceit, I trust you see why it is, dear friend, that your life has been a huge affront to the God of the Bible and why it is that you desperately need Jesus Christ to forgive you of all of your sins. You see, again, some of the things that Paul speaks about here are not the things that he speaks about, for example, in Romans, fornication, idolatry, homosexuality, and all the rest. No, here he speaks about other sins, selfish ambition, conceit, and pride. Now, those are inner sins. Those are things which uh, people don't see so much outwardly. But friend, because these things are true of you inwardly, and they have been in the front to the holy God of the Bible, I say, my friend, you desperately need Christ to forgive you and to cleanse you and to make you a true Christian. You've sinned against God, His holiness, His justice. You've sinned against His person and His being. God is perfect. God is flawless. He is impeccable. God is light and in Him there is no darkness. But my dear non-Christian friend, you are full of darkness. You're full of sin, you're full of pride, you're full of conceit. And the holy God of the Bible has seen all of these things, and because of these things, he's angry with you all the day long. You say, that's bad news. You're right, it is. It's very bad news. But you know what, my friend? Whenever we speak about the gospel, which is the good news, the only reason why it's good news is because we first understand the bad news. We understand the bad news that we're guilty before God. We understand that we violated this holy law, that we've shattered it a million times into a million pieces. We understand these things. We see ourselves as guilty before God, full of pride, full of conceit, full of self-seeking, etc. And thus we're worthy of his judgment, worthy of his condemnation, all true, all bad news. Ah, but then we keep reading our Bibles and we see that the same God who is holy and just and must punish us for our sins is the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to be a sacrifice for our sins so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so you see, my dear non-Christian friend here this day, whoever you are, you need Christ, simple and plain. 
You need Jesus and what he did on the cross in the place of the guilty. And what did he do with the cross in the place of the guilty? Well, in love he stood in the place of the guilty with their sins upon himself. And at the cross 2,000 years ago, he was punished in the place of the guilty. He bore the judgment of God due us in our place. God's wrath was poured upon him, the sinless substitute. And with our sins upon himself, he was punished in our place as our surety and as our substitute. And there at the cross, he made a full atonement to God for the sins of sinners. He accomplished redemption. He propitiated the wrath of God fully and freely. Thus, he cried out saying, it is done. It is accomplished. I've done it all. And so how do sinners receive what Jesus Christ did in their place? The answer is by faith and by faith alone. You remember what we read in the opening hour, Romans 4, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. He believed God. He, he trusted God with reference to his son, the, the promised seed Messiah who, who would die. Abraham understood the whole matter of uh, substitution. Take your only son and offer him. No, Abraham, don't do it. I See now that you trust me, Abraham. There's a substitute in the thickets. Take that one instead of your son. Abraham believed God. He trusted in the finished work of Christ who would die for his sins. Thus, this is why thousands of years later, Jesus could say to those in his own day, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Of course he was glad. Because he saw his Messiah. He saw his Redeemer. He saw Jesus by faith who would be crushed for his sins, who would cancel out all of his guilt, who through his vicarious bloodshedding would reconcile him to a holy God. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. My dear non-Christian friend this day, look to Christ by faith alone and be glad as well. Turn from your sins and trust in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago as the sinner's substitute. All who put their faith in his accomplishment will be saved. And the byproduct of their salvation is that they will be glad. They will be happy. And you know what, my dear non-Christian friend here this day? Truth be told, you're really not happy. You really aren't glad. What do you have to be glad about? You're a rebel before God. You're stinking in his nostrils. You're under his wrath. God is separated from you because of your sins. The world makes no sense to you because you're blind and you're deaf to the things of God. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. Turn from your sins. And trust in Jesus' person and work alone as the only ground of your acceptance with God. And God will forgive you of all of your sins. And he will make you glad. He will make you a very thankful individual. Can Christians here testify to that? Amen? You will see that we have every reason to be the happiest people on the face of the planet. We know God. And God knows us. And despite whatever difficulties we might go through in life or everyone experiences those things, we know God. God knows us. And His Spirit is within us. We love Him. He loves us. He gives us joy in the midst of difficulties. 
He's put a new song in our hearts. He's adopted us into his family. He has put glory before our eyes. Thus we are happy all the day. My dear non-Christian friend here this day, come to Jesus by faith and by faith alone and experience what all the true people of God in this place have experienced. The forgiveness of sins and great joy from our great God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for your word. Indeed, it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. But God, we need you to burn our text into our hearts so that we might be found walking in the ways of your commandments all of our days. Oh God, help us with our humility. Help us to fight against pride. Help us, positively speaking, to esteem our brethren better than ourselves. Help us to love one another just as you call us to do. We pray and we ask all of these things in that wonderful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.